Hey, welcome back everybody. Monday morning briefing, episode number 67. It's Monday, April the 4th. We actually got this one out on a Monday finally. I uh, owed it to you guys since we missed two weeks in a row there uh, last time because we were wrapping up the course and doing that kind of thing. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. First, uh, this weekend I was cutting a bunch of stuff, really just sorting in the cut room. We've got another leather shipment coming either the end of this week or the first part of next week. I was able to go ahead and, and uh, get some more belts cut out. We got our belt material packs. We got some more blemish grade packs cut out they did sell out over the weekend so those are gone again the, uh, some i guess people are really watching the website to see when those blemish grades are getting on there but like i said we are going to go up on those just a little bit as soon as i know what this next shipment's going to be because i think there's been a little increase in leather cost and on the blemish grades, I just gotta be sure that we're staying in line. Uh, as far as premium grade belt packs, we've got plenty of those. Uh, I believe we've got quite a few on there on the website. And I also went through, I had a little pile of the gun slings like we had talked about. Um, they were just, they were good enough for me. In fact, all of these that we've been tooling, if you've been following us on Instagram, we've shown a few different ones that we've just been kind of putting together just for the retail floor and the website. And so I've been tooling a few here and there when I got a little downtime on a saddle or, or something like that, I'll, I'll go over there and work on tooling one just to, to get an extra one. But these were actually done with the blemish grade, um, that what I would call a blemish grade of the gunslings. They're still fine. Some of them are worse than others, but what we did was I had a pile that was starting to, I was kind of sorting them out and setting them off to the side as I would sift through them. And some of those were, you know, kind of kind of iffy. And so I was just kind of pulling off of them as I needed them. But what happened is I ended up getting quite a few. So we put a few of those together in a uh, three pack. Again, those all sold out. They sold really quick. One guy bought like three or four packs at one time. As we get more of those, we'll add more of those onto the cut bench page. Like I said, the cut bench page uh, from the cut bench there on our website, that page is gonna be stuff like that. Just kind of oddball ones and twos. Uh, there may not be very many uh, of any one item. And when it's gone, it may not ever be back on there again. So if you do see something you need, uh, go ahead and grab that. I also went through and I had a big old stack. I mean, a big stack of bifold blemish grades. And so I just kind of let them pile up there and was just using them as I needed them for orders or making uh, wallets for the website again, things like that. It's kind of what I do with those. So I went through it and I put together a bunch of, uh, I think they're 10 packs or I can't remember how many, I think it's 10 for just a blemish grade, bifold backs only, no interiors, nothing like that. We put those on the website and I went through that, that pile like two times, maybe three times, I can't remember. Went through there and there was some that were just really bad. They just weren't really good um, and I was actually as I was sorting through them I was pitching them in a trash can because they were that that kind of just not something that I was going to use not something that I figured you would want to use but I had so many of them piled up in just a leather waste basket there I went ahead and pulled them out and we had quite a few so I went ahead and put those together in packs they're on the website they are on the cut bench page in particular and they're called a practice grade this grade here they're super cheap but they are going to be bad um, you may can get a wallet out of maybe one or two wallets out of that uh, a group of them i think they're 20 to a pack something like that but i'm not gonna lie to you they're pretty bad some of them aren't really good they may, may find a use for them somewhere what i thought was if you if somebody wanted them versus me throwing them in the dumpster go ahead and put them on there if nobody buys them no problem they start getting my way i'll chunk them but if uh if somebody wants them they're they're great to practice on i guess if you want to practice just swivel knife carving or just stamping or basket stamping you're kind of trying to practice a the technique they're great for that another thing that's good for that too is coasters if you've got a little coaster die or um, maybe you can buy coasters we may throw some coasters on the website at some point just for this purpose but some people like making coasters it's a popular item but coasters are a really neat thing just to have sitting there by your bench in a little box because if you ever have like an idea for a certain carving or a flower or some kind of little thing you want to try out a little uh, round three inch coaster four inch coaster that's a perfect practice piece to do that on and then you can save it if it's good chunk it if it's not but that's what we did this week like i said i just kind of added a bunch of stuff to the website and uh material pack wise trying to get ready for this new shipment to come in i've got a big pile of scrap you know just i say scrap pieces so uh necks bellies some butt cuts some things like that that we need to go through cut some more material packs out of and things like that and try to find something else that we can do with them um, and different products i can get out of them things like that because we've got to 
get room when that shipment comes in. Every time we get a new shipment, I always try to clean house just a little bit like we've talked about before. But but that's really what I did this weekend. Just kind of worked. I didn't work Sunday at all. I uh, stayed at the house. We actually had a full day of just barbecuing on Sunday. If you follow us on Instagram, you may have seen that. Been playing with the new pellet smoker. And uh, a lot of people were asking me, do I, you know, how do I like it? This and that. Some people were ribbing me about it. I understand that. I'm an old stick burner as well. I've always burned firewood in a, in a real pipe smoker and that kind of thing. I really am enjoying the, the pellet grill. It's got its own kind of quirks about it. Some things like I let the pellets run run out completely at one point. We were smoked a brisket yesterday and I let those pellets run out and so that it was completely empty. And that was kind of an issue there for a minute because I had lost fire and we were playing catch and practicing t-ball, baseball stuff and uh, I didn't catch it. So I had to kind of get everything restarted. So that was kind of frustrating, but that's my own fault. But all in all, I'm really liking it. I'm liking the control. I don't know that it's as good as a, as a real wood smoker, but it's not far from it. I mean, from where I'm at right now, I've only done one long cook on it, which was yesterday, and then two or three shorter cooks on it. And so far, I love the ease of it. It just makes it really easy to use. Makes it a lot, uh, a lot nicer during the week when there's a lot going on to be able to just fire up that thing and grill some steaks or you know pork chops, or whatever. Um, so yeah, I'm really enjoying it. We did not uh, put a final picture. Like I said, we posted a few pictures during the day just to kind of. I like to barbecue, so you guys know I like to put a lot of that on our uh, Instagram there, and all you guys like to barbecue too. Plus. We got to do something with all those byproducts. So I figure I might as well just post a bunch of pictures of burning byproducts since we're always, always posting on the leather. But I didn't get a final shot of the brisket just because it was like 9.30, I guess. Like I said, we lost a little time there when the flame, when the pellets had run out. And we had some uh, visitors yesterday evening and things. There's a lot going on. I'd cooked a lot of other stuff for dinner because on that thing, I didn't want to trust my timing ability uh, cooking a brisket for the first time on that cooker. So I went ahead and made some chicken and some other stuff for dinner, but I didn't pull that brisket off till I was really sure it was where I wanted to uh, pull it off at and it was like 9 30 something like that and so I didn't even cut it I let it sit and rest for an hour hour and a half and then I just wrapped it up and put it in the refrigerator and so I'll reheat that probably what I'll probably do is cut it in half and then freeze half of it I like to do that just to have it have it in the freezer for just a little weekend you know dinner for us or something we'll pop it back on the smoker and reheat it um, or in the oven or whatever and so but I'll try to cut that probably tonight maybe tomorrow we've got a busy week this week we've been really busy with little league and baseball and softball and so we've either got game or practice every night during the week usually except one night that's been keeping us keeping us pretty busy and most of our games here lately have been not starting until seven so we usually don't get home till you know nine ten o'clock nine o'clock probably somewhere around there but but hopefully i'll try to get a picture of that and see how it turned out I, I think it turned out good it felt right the brisket felt like it was just right so we'll see when i cut it open and we'll see what it looks like and i'll try to post a picture of that if i can remember but most importantly, last week we did complete, we talked about it in the Monday video last week, but we did complete the uh, tooling course that we were talking about, we've been talking about for months. We got it all absolutely completed. We ended up doing a soft launch to the newsletter on Friday and those folks got access to it and got to see uh, kind of the promotional video and what the curriculum's like and things like that. And we went ahead and, and uh, offered it to them and we had some enrollments. And I want to thank everybody that enrolled in the course over the weekend. It was really good. We've gotten a lot of good feedback on it already. A lot of people are real excited to get going on it. But today we're launching it out publicly. So if you've been to the website at all and seen that you may have seen it on our homepage, there's a little spot on there on the homepage that talks about it. And we also wrote a blog post talking about it and kind of what's going on with the course with some links for sign up. It is open for enrollment. So if you've been wanting to take this course and kind of hearing about it and waiting for it to come out, it's absolutely out. Again, good idea to be a part of the newsletter because we usually turn that kind of stuff out a little early for them and kind of give them an opportunity to kind of access it. Also gives us an opportunity to kind of have friends, so to speak, on the newsletter you know, that if they, they get it and if there's any kind of bugs or any kind of issues, we'll know about it kind of early before we just open it up um, to everybody and that way we can kind of test it out. But everything seems to be working great. Over the weekend, I did add a section to the course. So if you've already signed up for the course and kind of thumbed through it and just kind of gave it, gave it a quick look, then you wouldn't have seen the new section that we added. We actually made it live uh, this morning. And what it is, it's a critiquing session that we added into there that allows the students that are within the course for 30 days to have access to a critiquing session that's going to allow you to send me a picture in that course we tool five different panels five and a half by eight inches tall much like we've done before in the uh, tooling mini, mini series on youtube 
And with that critiquing session in there, it's kind of like an online coaching session almost, but to where you can send us a picture and any questions also, if you have a question about the course or anything like that, you can definitely go through that uh, or send your question through there. And then, but mainly you can send me a picture of your panel once you've completely tooled one of the patterns. So say pattern number one, once you're completely through with it, you can send me a picture of that tooled leather panel and I can go through there and just critique, um, give you some advice and critique any of your tool work and kind of see where I can help you. Everybody's usually on a different level as far as like either their carving is really, really good, their beveling is really, really good, but then they may have an issue with their thumbprints or they may have an issue with their decorative stamps um, or maybe their decorative cuts. And there's a lot of variation in there. Some people just have one little hang up, one little spot where they're having trouble Maybe it's just the casing that their tool work is actually really good, but they're tooling their leather far too wet. And so that's causing some issues and they're not aware of that. Those little things I'm hoping to be able to help you with that through the course as you go through all five patterns. Once you get a pattern tooled, you'll be able to just send that picture through that, through that teaching session or that critiquing session, and then I'll receive it on my end and I can be able to look at it and we can kind of go from there and I'll see where I can help you and give you any advice, any pointers, any things like that. I might ask you some questions about your work surface, kind of the tools you're using, different things so that we can try to hone in and see what uh, what areas of your tooling I can help you with best and how to do that. So I'm really excited about that little section on there because I think it adds a lot of value to the course. I was trying to figure out, I knew about it last week, I actually knew about it a few weeks ago when we were kind of finalizing the course and I knew I had that ability to add that to it. We use a platform called Teachable and they have the coaching sessions in there as, a, as another option, another another uh, product that they offer for the teaching side of things. And, and I, I knew I could use that, but I didn't know how to use it. So I wanted to be sure I understood it, that I could create the product, put it in there. It's included in the course. There's no extra charge for that. It's just part of the curriculum. And then uh, you will need to sign up for it. But I think it's a really neat deal. And I just wanted to make sure that it was all set up and it worked right. We ran a few tests with a couple people that were already enrolled in the course. And, it, and, and they really liked that. They thought that was really great, especially since it was wasn't in there when they first bought it. And uh, when we did that after the, after they purchased it, they saw that that was gonna add quite a bit of value right there just for doing it that way. But I think when you're tooling, it's one thing to have all the information. I think I said that in there, you know, you can get all the information. I was this way when I was learning. I had books, I had all kinds of things, but I didn't have anybody near me that I could go to as kind of a mentorship or, or to, to bounce ideas off of or get a little help or guidance. So it's one thing to have the information, then you practice that inf information and implement it that's a good thing too. But when you have somebody there that can kind of look at what you've done and then give you advice on how to make it better, or maybe notice some things that you're doing that you may not even notice, those things I think are really, really valuable. So when you go into the course, if you enroll in the course, you'll see all the curriculum. There's a section, it's probably over halfway through the course, getting kind of prepped up for the tooling, but it's a, it's a section that has uh, the complete tooling process, how I go from carving in a, a pattern all the way to de decorative carving it, completely finished. Um, at the end of that whole section there, and then you'll see the critiquing session there that you will have to sign up for. So if you don't want it, if you don't want critiques or you just you don't want to bother with it, you, don't, you certainly don't have to do that, but it is included in the course. Once you sign up with it, it basically just puts you in another little module thing to where you and I can send a message back. It's kind of like, I guess, a Facebook messenger or anything like that, but it's, it's within the course. And that way I can see your work and we can kind of help you from there. You have access to that 30 days from the day that you sign up for that part. So once you you enroll in the course you have lifetime access to everything in the course as far as all the videos it's over six and a half hours of footage in that course um, and you have access to all the worksheets and the patterns and everything that's in there you never lose that access anytime you want to come back or go through the course again or whatever you're more than welcome to do that um, you can hop around you can list, watch it all in reverse if you want to it doesn't matter but as far as that critiquing session you'll have 30 days access to that once you enroll with that piece so once so if you're if you just got the course so that you have it but you're really 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 busy right now as a lot of people are kids are in school there's baseball there's things going on if you don't have the time you may wait to sign up for that part until you have 30 days because what I would like to see I made it 30 days because I think that's plenty of time to go ahead and tool all five panels with focused intensity that way you get a panel tooled you send me a picture of it we'll do the critiquing you can work on those improvements on your next panel and move on and we can bounce all the way through all five of those tooled panels in there and hopefully really dial in your tooling skill and really help you there and add the most value. So that would be my recommendation if you're uh, 
you know, if you're kind of busy right now, but you want to go ahead and get enrolled just so you have it, you want to just be able to watch the videos and do that kind of thing, that's great. You got lifetime access to the whole course, but don't sign up for the uh, critiquing session until you're ready to spend 30 days, uh, or it may take you a week. I don't know, however much time you have, but it'll give you 30 days from the day you sign up for that to go ahead and get all those critiques done um, and get those panels uh, sent to me, just a picture of them. You don't need to mail the panels to me or anything like that. I just need a picture of them and then we'll visit back and forth and I can kind of help you and answer any questions that you might have. So we added that yesterday. I think it's a good value add. So if you wanna go check out the course, you can go to dgsalary.com and right there on the homepage, there is a link for the course. It's called Leather Floral Carving and Tooling and then it's Beginner. Um, like I said before, this is a beginner course, but it is for the serious beginner. This is uh, this is a pretty intense course. We're going to talk about everything having to do with tooling and stamping uh, just to get a good foundation on some floral patterns. All five of the patterns in there increase in intensity and difficulty to the fifth pattern. So as you're going through, the first pattern isn't super difficult, but it'll be more difficult than some of the ones that you may have seen. Um, but I think it's a really good course and I think it's really going to help. So if you want to check out the course, you can go to dgsaddlery.com and check that out on the homepage or just click the academy at the top and that'll take you there. And it's a course now featured within the academy. So as you can see behind me, I did get saddle number one, what I'm calling saddle number one. We got it finished. That is the very first saddle that I ever built. And um, we've got it now here on display in the shop. I had it on the sales floor pretty much all this week. And we had a few visitors and stuff and they got to see it and things like that. Heck, if you come in and you wanna sit in it, you can certainly do that. But it'll be here uh, just kinda on display. It's retired now for the most part. Not that it got worked real hard uh, through its life anyway, but we've got it here and, and it's kinda fun. And I kinda enjoy having it in here just cause it kinda reminds me you know, where I came from and kind of how far I've come as far as my builds. I never really feel like I'm even nearing a, a mastery level as far as saddle making in particular because it's, I think it's a lifelong study and I, I'm never where I wanna be. I'm always trying to fine tune little aspects here and there. Got a friend of mine I was kind of texting with back and forth this weekend some about uh, my horns. I'm never really ha satisfied with my horns and I think they're getting better, but I'm still kind of struggling with a couple aspects of it and he was great to help me out there and just kind of give me some advice and little techniques and stuff. Funny part is you're always swinging one way or the other. You know, you get used to doing it one way and then sometimes you, you kind of merge and, and try a different way and you try that for a while and then you try another way for a little while and then end up coming back to the way you originally learned or maybe somebody mentions, hey, you should maybe try this, try that. And it's like, that's, you've already tried that before and it actually worked. You've just kind of veered and uh, kind of strayed away from your original uh, teaching. So, but that's the way saddle making is. You, you're usually always tweaking it and trying to get better and trying to improve on it. But like with this saddle here, I built this saddle in 2002. Um, it's all Jimmy Plant's patterns. It's not something that, that, that I came up with, a floral pattern, the shape of the saddle, the, every bit of it. He basically just had patterns there available and some tooling patterns I could use. And so I did that. And so it, ba it very well mimics uh, one of his saddles or some of his work. And that's why it's kind of special to me because he passed away a number of years ago and uh, we were really close. And so that was, it's just kind of cool to have one of his pieces in here that, that him and I built together but it's very heavily influenced on uh, on Jimmy's work. And so I'm really glad to have it. Uh, we've also been working on saddles and trying to get those caught up. We hung a bunch of riggings this weekend, wrapped up a saddle horn, and we also got all the saddle parts cut out for the saddles that I'm building. Um, I don't usually cut out here lately. I used to, we would cut out a whole saddle, put it in saddle box. Now we had all your parts, you had everything to go. A lot of saddle makers do that. I've gotten lazy. I don't know if it's laziness or just being scatterbrained or just got too many irons in the fire. But over the last probably three or four years, I haven't done that. I've used, I've gone to where I just kind of cut the parts that I need to get through little phases. I've got my saddle builds broke down into phases. And so I'll just cut out the parts I need for that, get all that done, then work on the next phase. But with these saddles, I'm trying to get, make some headway this year and try to get caught up a little bit and kind of get ahead of the game because we're getting a little further out than I want to be. And so I'm gonna, on these three or four that I'm building now, I'm actually cutting the entire saddle out at one time. That way I can kind of stagger certain parts of the build because I don't need the tree. And if something's drying over there, I can be working on the fenders, the stirrup leathers, flank cinch, breast collar, all those kind of things can be done um, while the saddle's in a drying stage or in a different stage there where I can't do anything to it. So kind of working on that, having fun with that. I had somebody email me and they were asking if I would do a video kind of showing our drawdown stands that I use for building saddles. 
I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna kind of show you what my drawdown stands look like, give you some rough uh, measurements maybe. But the one thing I want you to realize is these stands aren't perfect. These stands are kind of utilitarian. I built them and they've evolved over, over some time and I've added things to them and kind of adjusted them. And the, my main stand actually needs to be rebuilt. It's actually got some issues and I've got to, got to kind of fiddle with it to make it work, but it, it's, it's square and true. And I like hanging riggings on that drawdown stand. So that's why I kind of use it, but I'll let you know kind of what I like and what I don't like about them. And then you can kind of go from there. I think a drawdown stand is kind of one of those things that you need to, it's a personal preference. You've got to kind of decide what style you like. I know the Al Stolman books have a really neat drawdown stand design that's in the back of those encyclopedias, or maybe it's a first volume or something like that. He put in there uh, kind of a schematic and plans for building one that he designed. And I think that's a pretty good one. I've never built on one of those. I know a few people that have stands that are similar to that um, and have stands that are way different than that. Uh, there, I've seen all kinds, all sorts, but I'll show you kind of what, what you're kind of looking for and the things that you need in a, in a good drawdown stand if that's what you've been trying to get ready to build your first saddle and you want to build a drawdown stand first so you're ready then I'll just kind of show you what I got and you can go from there. Okay so this is my main stand here that I use and I've built the majority of my saddles over the last I'd say 10 years on this stand. It's kind of built a little different than some of them. I think uh, a lot of them will have a cross board on the bottom. I think that's more uh, as far as for the feet instead of having four different feet on there like a normal stand would. They've got more of a crossbar foot. I never did one like that because I didn't like having to uh, have it have a wider footprint on there, but I think they do it for that reason in case your floor is a little unlevel The stand actually sets a lot more sturdy than having four different contact points touching the floor um, And my worry of having it have a wider footprint and me stumbling over it or tripping over it It's kind of moot with this crossbar right here when you're walking around the stand I'm constantly hitting this you got to kind of be careful walking around the bench because these things stick out further than the stand but the it's got a crossbar here and it's just wider than the stand so this particular crossbar is about three foot long and then the stands length total is about 27 inches and then height wise on my stand and mine's a little bit short for me but the height of it is about 38 inches to the highest point right here at the front somewhere around there but you need to really set these to the height for you depending on your height so it's ergonomically comfortable to be able to use the stand all day long but with mine the problem is i've gotten used to it being this low because i have more of an overview look at my work especially when i'm doing a horn or something like that this stand over here which is basically exactly the same as this one just heavier built it's taller than this stand and i find i don't use it for very many things just because i'm so used to this lower sitting stand I may try to phase that out as I get older and my back starts bothering me more and more and try to get a stand that's up just a little bit more. But right now I'm, I'm real comfortable on this stand. But the crossbar there, the purpose of that is for the strap. So you make a just a, a strap that goes along over the saddle. It's nice and wide. Uh, depending on the normal seat size that you do, you can always narrow these up a little bit. But the strap goes around there and then I've got a hook on the other side. And that hook hooks there and then we've got a pull bar or a pull down bar here that's attached with the hinge on the back side of the stand and then it's i've cut this piece here out of steel with just like alligator teeth or jaws there and i've just got a tab of metal on that piece of wood very utilitarian not very custom furniture like but then you pull that down and you just put it in place and that holds your saddle to the stand and that's the purpose of a drawdown it's kind of hold your tree in place as you work so your tree's not walking around on you moving around um, and it's also when you pull your seat in you'll use this strap that's very helpful to pull that seat down into the saddle uh, tree and that way you get it formed and everything when i was talking about my stand being messed up is because my hinge and my little thing, everything's getting wore out. I've used it for so long that I now I take this rubber sander, hand sander, palm sander, and I have to put that in there a lot of times if I'm really working hard on a tree as far as rubbing a seat in or doing something like that. I put that in there just to keep it from popping out because sometimes it'll pop out pretty easy and then my saddle tree is loose again. So that's kind of one of the things that I was kind of visiting about. Um, and then I've got an attachment. I'll talk about that later, but I got that idea from Terry Henson. I got a 
uh, bracket on the back that I can have a, a bar over the top so I can hang my laser and then get shoot some grid across the saddle and stuff. That's a fairly new thing in the last four or five years of my work, trying to add, add that one tool there to just try to help line things up, find center lines and line up riggings and things. But it comes in pretty handy, but that's not needed on every stand. Um, but that's it. Um, right here, whenever we get to, uh, when you build one of these, you're normally going to build it. You're normally going to build these out of dimensional lumber. And so what happens is when you make your, your however you're going to make your angles for the tree, I suggest just having a tree or an old saddle and figuring that out. And um, when you put your boards on there, your tree doesn't end up really sitting well on there. It kind of wobbles because you're it's not contoured like a horse's back. So one thing that we did was we just kind of stacked leather on there and I've just cut chunks of leather and just started with wider ones and then stepped my way up to smaller ones in order to fill that gap also in the back right here. And that way when I put a tree on there, it kind of chalks up in place and it has a place it sets. And so that makes it really nice for hanging riggings and getting my skirt line straight and where I want them because that tree doesn't wobble or tilt. Um, it, there's only one good place it's set. So as long as I've got it chalked up there, then the tree is secure, level, like it, it would be on a horse's back. It keeps everything. We've kind of adjusted it over years. Kind of takes a little bit of, of uh, kind of tweaking to get it to where it is correct. But this tree or this stand is correct for my trees for hanging my riggings level so that when they're on the horse's back, the rigging is level and not tilted downward or tilted up. Everything is where it needs to be. And so that's what we've just kind of done over the years, just kind of added that leather. I did that a long time ago and lucked out and got it just right. But once you stack those little leather pieces on there, stair step like that, you can take a skiver and really skive that in and get it to match the crown of your bar pad. And that way that tree sits in place. I've seen some of these done with like a really high density foam or something like that you can just mirror the bar the, the opposite side of the bar and that way everything sets whatever you got to do but that is really handy instead of if you imagine none of this here that tree sitting on here when you pull the seat in the tree's going to do that um, it, it doesn't have a choice and so i recommend shaping it however you need to so that your stand is straight and secure and your tree sits where it needs to be that's really all I got for you this week, guys, on the Monday briefing. Like I said, if you're wanting to take that course, you can go to our website and check it out and find out more information about that. If you have any questions, just give us a holler and I'll help you out any way I can. This week, we will have a podcast episode come out on Thursday. And uh, we were dark last week. We had one out the week before with Jason Thigpen. Great interview. Really interesting. He's a cool dude. And this week's episode, I think, is going to be just as interesting. He's kind of a big guy in the uh, saddle industry and the Western gear industry and things like that. So I think you're really going to enjoy it. That'll be out on Thursday. Hopefully, if I don't get tied up with uh, stuff in the shop and stuff and don't get it posted. But it's been edited. It's ready to go. And so be on the lookout for that on Thursday. And if you haven't heard our podcast yet, go to dgsaddlery.com and click on podcast. And you can listen to the Lost Trade podcast right there on our website. Or you can find us on Apple and Spotify. I appreciate you guys, and we'll see you all next week in the Monday Morning Briefing.